David Ottlinger, it's good to see you. Good to see you, Dad. Welcome to the Sophia audience. Uh, I am with David Ottlinger, who, after Massimo, is my second most common uh, and equally beloved discussion partner. Uh, he also, of course, writes for us over at the Electric Agora. Uh, David, would you like to give a little uh, introduction of yourself? And I'll do the same, and then we can get started. Uh, my name is David Ottlinger. I do block at the Electric Agora. Um, I studied philosophy first at the University of Chicago, then at GSU, and now I'm sort of uh, wandering the wilderness. Uh, you're, a, you're a wayward, itinerant philosopher at this point. <laughs> If, if, if you say so. No, I'm not, uh, not recognized by the EPA. <laughs> well, keep, keep writing the kind of stuff you're writing for us, and you're going to be a major no. name, all I can say. Oh, thank um, you. I'm, I'm Daniel Kaufman, and I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. Uh, I'm obviously one of the – I host the SOFIA program, and I also uh, uh, publish and edit the uh, Electric Agora with Daniel Tippins. Um, so, David, um, you wrote uh, an essay for us. It just went up on the Electric Agora. It's titled Meaning, Message, and Experience. And um, uh, I really, really like it. I think it's really interesting. It gets at questions of the effects and constraints uh, of medium on uh, 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 various forms of popular entertainment like television and film. And, um, and I thought that there was so much there that, to discuss, and I think we even might have some disagreements that might be interesting uh, to sort of work through and stuff. So I thought uh, we would talk about that today. Does that sound like a plan? Yes. <laughs> so wh why don't you um, give us just a brief, I mean, the, we'll link to the essay, of course, so that people can read it um, while, they, you know, as a companion to the dialogue. Why don't you give us a, just a sense of um, uh, the main theses in the essay? Right. So this whole thing became, uh, was, it fell down a rabbit hole. It became 7,000 words. But uh, I know I had to edit it, but <laughs> it was a very clean 7,000 words. I mean, it really okay. required almost no editing at all. It, it, did it t you didn't write that over a lot of sittings. I mean, that's had a very consistent kind of, did you write that pretty much in a short period of time? Uh, it was kind of over a period of time, but I do tend to write in, like, spurts. Oh, okay. I, I sit okay. down and 3,000 words come out or whatever. I wish I could do, like, Hemingway, write 400 words every day. No, I you can't know? do that either. That piece, yeah. I lose, the, you, I get an inconsistent voice then if I do right. that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, so what led you to the rabbit hole? Um, thinking about your TV watching experience? Yeah, I'm, I'm a... I'm, these new streaming shows, mm -hmm. uh, I've watched a whole bunch of them. Unfortunately, I'll have to watch The Handmaiden's Tale to get more variety because I'm kind of Netflix centric. But um, so you haven't watched Man in the High Castle or um, no, I haven't. Yeah, okay, I have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. But you know, watching a lot of the Netflix series, which were made by different people. Um, you know, watching Orange is the New Black and Stranger Things and uh, uh, the different Marvel shows, I realized that there was sort of a common sensibility, a, a, a sort of uh, a formula or a format. Or that you think is affected by the fact that they are streamed and that they're that they are meant to be watched in blocks, that they're not one well, week, then the next week. Ultimately, That's yeah, yeah. But I mean, at first, it just struck me that these are different, and mm. why should why should that be? And um, I, as sort of thinking about that, I sort of started to think about television in general and how it's changed over my lifetime. And uh, and what would that lifetime be? So, what is your tell? What is the, the the space of your television experience? Um, yeah, so it's a. Uh, it's a shame I'm, I'm uh, I, I don't go back as far as I do. Part of, you know, you can help me. But um, the early stuff that I really remember sort of being sort of like a part of life, it's like Seinfeld and Friends and the early stuff in the 90s. I didn't watch Friends because it was terrible. 
But so the ni- in the nineties, so you did watch TV when it was you waited a week to watch the next episode. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Remember? Yeah. Do you remember the the last few Seinfeld episodes? Yes. Where they 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 had these ads that was like uh, the gorilla, the you know. Congo gorillas, three hundred and eighty-four left. And, you know this, this, the black rhinoceros, two hundred and sixty-four left. New Seinfeld episodes, only four left. Right, <laughs> and then, then it went down. It went down each week, and it was like it, that. The, unfortunately, the well, the two things that felt like huge events in television in my lifetime was the last episode of Seinfeld. And unfortunately, the other one is the first Survivor, where it felt like that was like uh, felt like everyone was watching that. You know? Yeah, it was, attention. Yeah. Was you strange. had a sense. You had a sense that you were part of a community that was watching something that included a lot of people you didn't know. It was sort of you felt a part of a, a, yes. a, a cross section of the country. Um, um, yeah, um, I, I think I, I have to go back and look, but I want to say that. The last episode of MASH was watched by about a hundred million people, which is incredible. Which is unfathomable. Unfathomable. Uh, I think people don't understand how popular popular culture was before it became cut up into niches the way it is now. Um, um, I think well, people also underestimate the the, the, the impact of that. Um, well, uh, Jerry Seinfeld even talked about Seinfeld was like the last mass television. Um, I think that's probably right. Yeah, yeah. You know, before you know, Johnny Carson was something that America watched, or you know, the Beatles coming on Ed Sullivan. Yeah, yeah. Something. I like that expression that America watched. I think that's definitely true of Seinfeld being one of the last ones that you could say that about. Um, mm. um, yeah, go on, go on. Yeah, my parents are um, are uh, baby boomers, so they remember, you know. They've talked about, you know, how it was different. Yeah. You know, he felt you could talk about what Ed Sullivan was doing at school and everyone knew. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and did you, and but you said now you said to me in private conversation that you, you did but you have also watched quite a bit of old television, right? So in reruns. That's true as well. So what are some um, of the old series that you've watched? Like the, the before like, your birth series that you've right, watched. Right, yes. Um, grew up a uh, three Stooges fan. Mm. Which is great because the old bot builders are very evident there. Um, I saw a lot of I love Lucy. Um, I saw a little bit of Honeymooners. Unfortunately, not, I, it's unfortunate that it wasn't more. Yeah, uh, looking back on it now, but yeah. you know the old Nick at Night shows were were on, so I got exposed to them. Yeah, you mentioned in the in the in the essay you mentioned All in the Family. Have you watched a good a good amount of that? Yeah, unfortunately not in a long time, but yes. Yeah, I remember that was something I uh, watched quite a bit. And like, I, was it your parents that turned you on to those things? Yeah. How did you find and, those and, things? And extended family, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, it was kind of nostalgia. Again, they're, they're baby boomers. So, so this is what led you to the rabbit hole. But so, so once you went down the rabbit hole, what are some of the themes that began to emerge that, that, that then get expressed in the essay? Well, yeah, it's a good transition because um, the watching all in the same day in um, whatever nineteen ninety seven. So it's it's twenty twenty years old at that point. Right. <laughs> it's incredibly recognizable if you grew up on Seinfeld or even on Friends. Right. right. Just the basic... The same uh, model is what you're saying almost, yeah. 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 Um, I used Kuhn's word, so uh, paradigm. Which yeah, actually, that's fine, yeah. Um, it, and sort of in Kuhn's sense here, which is uh, things imitating other things, right? So imitating others becomes a kind of established way of doing things, or tradition. Uh, so... Should I just dive into sort of? Yeah, why don't you talk about was? what some of the main theme, what some of these themes are that you thought were interesting enough to write an essay about? Um, yeah. So I mean, it struck me that originally there was kind of a theatrical paradox 
So I, I should say, uh, I put a little disclaimer on my essay, which I'll repeat, which is that, you know, I'm not a historian of television, which exists. And um, so this is, uh, as I, I quoted Luther, I decided to sin boldly. And um, <laughs> just go ahead and tell a story here. This yeah, is kind of this is a this is a sketch here. Yeah, theory. It's uh, it's uh, responsive to evidence, and uh, you gave me a little pushback on something. Yeah, We're yeah, which I'll bring up as as it comes up. Yeah, yeah. So but, it's theatrical, and and it, you don't just yeah. mean that metaphorically. I mean, it literally was. I mean, a lot of these were filmed in front of live audiences, right? I mean, um, writing about it, I was struck that it's the same word stage. Yeah. Because um, you, you refer to it as a sound stage, which is a different kind of stage, but it's the same the same word, and it's the same kind of physical location, right? So, um, just thinking about the basic physicality of it, and and again, these are two shows, All in the Family, Seinfeld, twenty years apart. They're remarkably similar in that. Um, Okay, there's no fourth wall, right? So you're, you're looking at a room with two walls coming in. There's the wall in the back. I mean, they're not all literally three walls, but there's some basic structure. And then there's no fourth wall, so the audience can sit out here. The cameras can be out here. And, I mean, that in and of itself is significant because you, you're – automatically reminded it's not real. And certainly the studio <laughs> audience, the live studio audience is aware of it. They can see all of the, I mean, there's a bit more illusion for the television audience. Mm -hmm. um, Except as but, the television audience, we can hear the live audience. That's right. That's right. That's which right. Which means that we know, um, we know that it's an illusion. That's a constant reminder that um, what's you know? This is not. We're not a fly on the wall. This is being put on for um, for our entertainment. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, some of those shows they had. I've been struggling for the right words. They have sets that were. They can't quite be called abstract. Um. But they're designed in such a way that they don't mind you noticing that they're sets, right? They're not, quite real, they're not quite realistic rooms, I guess, in a sense, right? I mean, right. And I want to be careful because there's, there's obviously a realism. It's something I call the family. It's, it's, uh, it's a sort of, I don't know, if you're thinking of like the, the prologue of um, the glass menagerie, there's that kind of balance of realism and uh, uh, you know, poetic, more poetic realism. Yeah, yeah. Where, where, you know, you're seeing some harsh reality. You know, it's, it's not a not a manner. It's, uh, you know, a middle-class guy in Chicago and um, sort of ready. Right, and real, real, pro real problems and you know, all in the family addressing social issues that were very topical at the time that the whole country was going through, um, yeah. whether it's feminism or race relations or, or class. Really. But it's not realistic in another sense, right? It, it, it's not realistic in, 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 in sort of visual or other sense of verisimilitude, right? I mean, it, yeah. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Think, yeah. Of, think of the sense of Mad Men or, or The Sopranos where... Uh, well, particularly Mad Men because they're sets, right? Um, where part of part of the the prestige, as they say, but also just part of what was distinctive about that show was it felt like you were walking into a room at night, six right, the, right, and they they you know they made they had departments make combs and soda cans and newspapers that looked all accurate to the period you don't quite nobody quite cares about that in, right uh, right in these old shows they, they they care about creating the right setting the right atmosphere um giving you the information about 
you know, if you if you took all the actors out and you just saw the livery of, of, of all the fandom, you'd know something about these people, right? Yeah. It's deliberately chosen. And you'd get some sense of the mood. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's not, not the most cheerful place in the world. There might be a little, little tension going on. Um, uh, but they didn't try to seem that realistic. And um, just the visual, the visual language, right? You sat, I think it's quite significant that the cameras tend to sit more back. Um, we're more likely to see uh, several characters at once standing at a fair distance from each other sometimes. Um, and if you think of all the families, the Archie's living room, Archie and Edith's living room, and Jerry's, <coughs> um, Jerry's living room in his apartment, it's pretty much the same set, and it's pretty much... Um, well, it's significant that they both sort of formed home base for the show. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There were other sets in both shows, but that was where most of the goings on went on. And when 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 you wrote a scene where a bunch of people had to talk, they they would that's where the show preferred it to take place. Yeah. Yeah. And and a lot of you know, especially in Sunfield, it kind of strained credulity. Like why are all these 30 something people hanging out in this guy's <laughs> living room. Like, people don't really live like this. And the because you want them all to talk to each other, and this is going right. to be the room where these people all talk to each other. So, so, so in what Now, you think that, that, that these sorts of, let's call them formal choices, right, having mm -hmm. to do with the form, the form, are partly a function of both the constraints and the, and the um, how should I say, the best uses of medium, right? Yeah, so go back to the 70s. Um, oh, and I want to say also about those sets. It was one yeah. of the things is that they, they made room for a lot of stage traffic. And Seinfeld has talked about People coming in and out, you mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, as you saw, there's a lot of physical comedy in Seinfeld, you know, but people would be, people would be walking around the little breakfast bar and then would be, you know, yeah. fall, going back and forth across the couch. And, and Kramer you know. would sort of burst into the room, which, by the way, is was totally ripped off from Taxi when Crazy Jim would always burst in and he'd or, come in sort of like this. I actually, I actually wondered why more people didn't point out that Kramer just seemed straight out ripped off from Christopher Lloyd's Jim from Taxi. Um, uh, well, or, or just Jackie Gleason, who's famous for entrances and exits where yeah, he was yeah. a, you know he was a huge guy and then be, you know boom he'd be right up in art carney's face yeah. was, you know uh a huge physical presence and you know I, there's a scene i can remember from the honeymooners where um i'm sorry i don't remember his wife's name uh, alice alice was coming in and then and, trixie was art carney's wife's name yeah right alice yeah. and trixie are sitting talking to and uh, Alice wants to get uh, him to go out, um, and and she says, "Now listen to me. This is what's going to happen when he comes in here. He's going to come in here and he's going to tell us a whole big sad story and song and dance that this was the hardest day he ever had." I think, <laughs> <laughs> and then they all turn, and so you know, we're all trained on this door. Here's what's going to happen, and then Jackie Gleason comes in. You know, He's huge. He's everywhere, and he's like, "Oh!" <laughs> and it's a it's a great bit, but there's that moment where you're focused on that door, and he has to come in with all that energy to, to just blow through your expectations to be bigger than what you expected, to be. and he does that. And yeah, you know, um, actually, Jason Alexander is recognized that he was doing Jackie Gleason when he was doing like some of his. Well, the, yeah, the, the yeah. growly kind of stuff. He's channeling. That's, I'm sure they'd be fine with all those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah acknowledging the antecedents. So but, how did you, you were talking about medium in the 70s. So so what do you, what, yeah. how do you think that that, how did medium 
affect this, these this, these formal dis, dis decisions on the part of the the creators? You think? Yeah. So think about a 1970s television. I go back just far enough where I can remember, you know, at least like early 80s television. Right. You, I remember. Which you weren't much different. I mean, you know, a big, big box, you know, with vacuum tubes and. and big, uh, big box, small screen. Um, I'm, some of them were, a lot were black and white. We had a black and white one when I was a kid. Um, uh, you know, and they're fairly granular, fairly blurry. Uh, low resolution, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite low resolution. So you got to think about what it would be like. You know, you can film anything, but what's it going to look like once it gets out to the audience? And, well, if you're looking at a fairly small picture from fair, fairly far away, you know, what, 10 feet? If it's granular, if it's grainy, if it's if the colors run and are blurry, and you can't produce all that many colors, not like not like projecting film, <coughs> you know, you're not going to be, um, you know, using color like Antonioni or Zoo, or <coughs> you're not going to be, um, you know, composing extremely complicated, intricate frames like Orson Welles um, or Fellini. Or you said close-ups, right? You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. close-ups don't make a lot of sense if you're... Yeah, yeah the only close-ups I can think of, like in All in the Family, was when there was a very powerful emotional moment. Yes. And so the emoting of the actor is what's really coming through, not the image, right? I mean... <laughs> And they were um, relatively rare. Yeah, like when, yeah. Arthur, when, when Edith dies, uh, there's a close-up yeah. on Archie um, that's pretty devastating. Um, um, but they can also have strong emotions in a social context. Yeah. Where, where even sadness or anger or, you know, <clears throat> with two characters and, you know, a flat shot uh, standing six feet apart from each other. Yeah. They, they yeah. could make it happen in that context, but they usually did. Um, and that just, and again, that was totally recognizable if right. you were watching Seinfeld. And so that's why you, your idea is that that's sort of, back in the 70s, you know, this would be a categorical distinction between television and film, right? Yes. That, that film would be not theatrical, film would be, and you're going you're gonna to talk about what film was like in contrast, you know, the Kubricks and the Scorseses and the, um, and that, um, that this was a good part due to the medium itself, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, if you think of 1977, uh, that was the year that um, uh, A New Hope hit. That star, the first Star Wars, yeah. Yeah, and it, it be part of, a lot of people like to emphasize that it became such a huge hit in part because what had run up to it had been so dour. <laughs> And, um, you know, film had been dominated for that decade by a lot of great, but really dark and um, challenging filmmaking. So Terrence Malick, uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick, um, uh, uh, Martin Scorsese, um, uh, what, what name am I going to leave off? Uh, oh, uh, da, 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 uh, Roman Polanski, uh, Francis Ford Coppola, of course. Um, these guys, was, I mean, the golden age of American auteur filmmaking. But they were make the stuff they were making was great. It was, you know, dark, challenging, and um, a lot of great chilly silences. I read, I, I, Identified 2001 in terms of Alex Badlands as being particularly sort of stark examples. Um, Badlands focuses on two characters who are incredibly incommunicative, where part of what's going on in that movie is they have important things to say to each other that they're unable to say. So the, the, the and it, wor it works in film in a way that it wouldn't in television at the time because film 
had that grant that that film quality that cinematic yeah. quality that that television simply didn't have and so what would have been deadly terrible in a television medium was what worked really well in a film is what sort of we can see sissy spacek's face and you know the see slight emotion just sort of um just pass pass through but which he's unable to say you can't or you or it wouldn't be very pleasant to do on television with those big theory screens um which i think is very important in understanding why something like you know the honeymooners um all in the family of seinfeld like you know it's like 60 years they're all wall-to-wall -wall talk yeah there it's um again like the theater it's they the reliance on the, the written word is perfectly sensible because it's what they had and even the, that's even true of the action shows you know like kojak mm -hmm. or or you know or um i'm trying to think of other 70s sort of actiony you know either cop programs or or um they were also still very talky um um uh I mean, even if you watch, uh, I mean, the dinosaur formats today, like I think Law and Order SVU is technically still on. I mean, God knows why that isn't the thing. That is a blight on the culture. But, um, oh, God. <laughs> um, but I mean, those, that show, and I mean, that's contemporary. It's still just nobody takes a breath. It's like um, Howard Hawks or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolute waves of verbiage. But yeah, uh, but it strikes me, you know, the tech had changed a lot by the 90s. I mean, not, I mean, it wasn't what it, what it is today. But this paradigm remained sort of firmly in place. Yeah. Through to Seinfeld, which is the 90s. Yeah. Yeah. And then so, pretty, so pretty much from what you're saying is pretty much from after the second world war right basically from you know sort of from your honeymooners and and those cla i love lucy those classic shows you pretty much had the same uh formal television retained largely the same formal properties uh yeah. and you think it's because large in a good sense in good part because of the of the constraints affected by the medium by the technology well yeah i think that's how they formed and then i think they they had the staying power because uh, uh That was the way people knew how to do things. Like you know, <laughs> well, look, the th we still have the theater, right? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> right. I mean, and so, and so, the fact that you know you kind of had something like the theater that was being broadcast, it's not surprising that um, you know it had legs um, because it's not as if the theater has gone anywhere. Um, no, but all those theaters changed. Well, certainly you have the big production musicals that that are more and more technically amazing. But and, maybe, and, maybe, and maybe this is something we'll get to, but you know, that just strikes me as such vastly inferior theater. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, but think of Peter Brook and his, he wanted to deconstruct uh, or dismantle. Uh, right, 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 the, right. The Victorian style. He, he, it bothered him that there were footlights between the audience and, and the people on the stage. That there should be no barrier. Right, Things right. Like bring up the house lights. So that they emphasize, you know, we're all in this room together. I mean, we're not talking about Peter Brook, but um, you know, theater changes has its own paradigm struggle. Yeah. But but I think the, the point is that I think this remained in place because people learned how to do things. Um, you could do, you could find the kinds of effects that uh, all in the family found. Um, you know, and, and, you know, Seinfeld was obviously, you know, all the guys who worked on that show, they were, uh, guys and gals were students of their predecessors and they were right. taking in what was possible, um, from that. And then it strikes me that it all changed and, you know, there was a sort of fairly rapid change. And we went to something that was a lot more like film. You know, yeah. Called, yeah. Um, the thing I'm calling the cinematic paradigm. Yeah. Which I saw 
you and think I'm, you think that that mainly starts with the HBO the HBO shows? Well, yeah, Sopranos I mean, and um, that was my first thought. What mm -hmm. was the other? What was the other one you mentioned? The Sopranos and what was the other oh, one? Oh, Sex in the City. Sex in the uh, Sex in the City. Yeah, there there are things in Sex in the City, um, <laughs> which are things you'll find in a film textbook, right? But um, if people remember the scene, if people know the show. Carrie sees a certain post-it note from a certain person, which has an unwelcome message, <laughs> and it's uh, it's a great, it's very instructive for that show because they don't. I went back and looked at it. They don't play any music, <laughs> and if you know that show, it's full of music. The, yeah, it's wall to wall. Do, yeah. do, do. The little jazzy rhythms are always in the background. They actually use the score from eight and a half. So. Did they really? Yeah, it was. And, uh, it worked. They, probably, they probably could count on the fact that nobody who watched Sex in the City had any <laughs> idea. What eight, eight had, probably, had no idea what eight and a half was. Well, I, I did. <laughs> you did. Well, yeah. But, I went. But you were only watching it for the. You only watching the show because there were a bunch of hot women in it. That's the only reason you were nah. watching. <laughs> but um, you're not for anthropological research. I mean. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I wrote seven thousand words. I'm <laughs> just joking. No, I know. So no, you think that? But, the, the, uh, yeah, go on. I, I wanted to say this one scene: music suddenly goes wet, and you feel it. And she she goes, she's looking for someone. She woke up and he's not there, and she's calling out his name. And you're like, oh, this isn't good because there's no music. No, where's the happy little music we used to hear? And, and she finds the post it note. And she sweeps some flowers off her table in her rage. And they do something that's called a match on action shot, which is two shots match, and they match on the action that they show. So we, base, we see her, we see the flowers fly off the table twice. We see her hand hit the things twice. And this is a classic thing. It, uh, everybody who studies films at all, knows their two classic master on that. Battleship of Lincoln and uh, Do the Right Thing. Where, and it's generally, in Battleship Potemkin, somebody smash, oh, proletariat smashes a plate that says, give us today our daily bread. And um, in Do the Right Thing, somebody throws a trash can through a window. A glass window, that, yeah. That becomes, uh, <laughs> that, and it's very surprising that he does this, and it means a lot in that context. It means so, everything in that context, yeah, that, right. when, when Mookie does that, yeah. yeah. Oh, shh, shh, people haven't seen the movie. We oh, don't yeah. know who threw it. A fucking 40 year, I'm sorry. A, <laughs> I can't spoil a movie from 1988 or whatever, I mean, can you no. break me? No. That's not how <laughs> movies work. That's not how movies work. Not oh, everybody's geez. seen every movie. All so, right, all right. Um, Dan said that. I'm, I didn't this, Send me the hate mail. <laughs> <laughs> but is, it, in all three examples, it's a, a fairly instantaneous gesture. Smash a plate, throw a, throw a trash can, knock some flowers over, but it means a lot. So what do you do when you have an instantaneous gesture but the audience has a lot of meaning to that gesture. You elongate it. How do you elongate it? You show it twice. And if you do it really rapidly, it seems fairly natural. And it's, so it's a classic technique. So it was a little statement, really. Um, what it was interesting, and it was interesting in part because it was cinematic. You've never seen that in Seinfeld. You've never seen that in all the fan um, it was part of the standard cinematographer's bag of tricks, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, you'll you'll hear about it in the classrooms. So I'm, you can look up. The, I'm sure there are a thousand YouTube videos. And yeah. You'll find the Battleship the Pentagon, but or you'll yeah. just find somebody say yakking about the match on action shot. Right? Yeah. 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 And that that sort of represented a sort of sea change kind of revolution and it was significant and there were other ways too i think um, sex in the city was determined not to have a home base not to have a security department not to yeah have, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh 
Clark Jean's living room. It was which meant it, it was it 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 fully was departing from this ensemble sort of theatrical mm -hmm. model, um, not just in terms of the visual. Uh, uh, tricks and, and tropes that it uses, but in a sense, the entire structure of it was 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 they abandoned that kind of well, they ensemble been, based TV. I mean, it was still ensemble, ensemble based, based, but yeah. but they weren't physically located in a way, right? Yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the example I, the way I phrased it, the piece is they abandoned sort of the visual grammar. <laughs> the, yeah, the that's a good word. The visual grammar. That's good. Yeah, is they kept the kind of ensemble feeling where, in the same way that we learned to care about Edith and Archie and Beachhead and Gloria, uh, there's, we learned to care about these four women and their relationships, and we visit them, and we, uh, one of my favorite comments, Norm MacDonald wrote on Roseanne, and um, <laughs> he said when he first got there, he read the scripts, and he was a stand-up, and he said, well, this is all going to die. They're just going to go up there and eat it because there are no jokes here. And then you realize, like, oh, no, they're going to laugh at this, not because the joke is funny, because they like that guy. Yeah. That they recognize him from last week and the week before that. And, you know, that still remained in place where you develop relationships to these characters. And they're then sort of get embedded in their relationships to each other. But visually, uh, the way the way it presents itself to us is it, it all different. And The Sopranos continued this. It, the Sopranos was massive. Um, and, you know, I'm a true blue dyed in the wall Sopranos fan. I think the last two episodes are as good or better than almost any film I've seen in its original theatrical run. Yeah. Uh, so, so you initially, your initial thoughts about this shift to the cinematic paradigm within television was that it was a positive development. Um, yes. I, I, the sense I got from you was that it began as a positive development and then it became increasingly not a positive development. Um, but let me ask you before we get to your your narrative about how it went from being a positive development to not one. Let me ask you why you would think it's a positive development to begin with, and that is, why isn't it better to have two distinct media doing two very different things than to lose one and have it be in a sense absorbed by the other? In other words, I'd rather have films and shows like All in the Family mm -hmm. rather than films, and then more films on television. Yeah, well, it strikes me that that's not what happened. They were, the, the Sopranos and Mad Men and shows like that are still distinctive from television, or okay, from so film proper, even yeah. though they, I call this a cinematic paradox, but it's still not cinema. Um, it's important that it's imitating cinema in certain ways, but I think it almost you know, probably without knowing or intending, it sort of developed its own distinctive kind of quality, um, its own sensibility. Right. In other words, it didn't just become cinema and television. It was more that television stayed, kept a lot of its distinctive qualities, but absorbed some of the the quality-enhancing effects of cinematic production and, yeah. and direction and stuff. One of the things I mentioned in the piece is I was always implacably opposed to, to a Sopranos movie. I'm so glad they didn't do it. <clears throat> um, a Sopranos movie is just Goodfellas, right? I mean, that's just, yeah. right? <laughs> well, you, you can do a movie. You can get James Gandolfini and Amy Falco and all, get everyone together and do a Soprano, do a movie with all those characters and people, but it wouldn't be the Sopranos. Yeah, you, I mean the visual is fun. You can adapt the visual and still still have it uh, be the same thing, but without the time, without the the one of the, the glorious things about this film is the rhythm of everyday life. Tony right, going and down that and that's due not to the medium in terms of the technology. That's due to the the extended time that you have for a TV series to unfold over the course of years. Is what you're saying. Yeah. 
Well, I still see that as belonging to the media. It's not the, the physical television set, but it's the way, you know, the way things get broadcast yeah. over yeah. time. Is yeah. you, you know, uh, it's hundreds of hours long. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or maybe yeah, not yeah. hundreds, but yeah. hours and hours and hours. And, and yeah. you you have time for the kind of novelistic detail. That's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I want you to talk about that, but let me just ask you very quickly, um, because it may actually be pretty irrelevant, but it was something I raised with you in, in private conversation. Does it affect your thesis at all if I say, hey, you know, you're dating the entrance of these cinematic techniques and tropes a bit too late, that as early as 1977, this was being, sorry, 1978, this was being done on television with, uh, with Battlestar, the original Battlestar Galactica, which consciously was building upon the huge success of Star Wars and even employed the Star Wars special effects guy, John Dykstra, um, um, to produce a very cinematic program on television. And it was noted for being that. In other words, I mean, that was one of the things that was so notable about it at the time. And if you don't like that one, then the other example I was going to give was, is not much later, and that's Miami Vice, which also, which brought in a very famous film director, Michael Mann, uh, who created the show, um, also incorporated uh, and brought many of the cinematic elements into television. And that also was explicitly said about it at the time. And also in the case of Miami Vice, and this wasn't true about Star Galactica, introduced the bringing of popular, very, very major popular music uh, mm -hmm. uh, sc pieces into the scores. Um, and these would be things that then would also be on MTV. And a lot mm -hmm. of times the music videos for the songs would be from the Miami Vice episode. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking like Phil Collins in the air tonight mm -hmm. and, and so on and so forth. Um, does it affect your thesis at all if indeed this started earlier? Or is it really not, it doesn't affect the thesis much that, that you're trying to advance? No, it probably does. You know, Symbol uh, Yeah, I'm very interested. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, Michael Mann, I didn't realize. Was the guy behind Miami Vice, yeah. Uh, Michael Mann is, uh, to me, I think a somewhat obnoxiously formalist director. Um, oh, God, I love him. Do you really? He did the he did the movie that was before Silence of the Lambs. He yeah, did, and I thought it was I thought Manhunter was ten times better than Silence of the Lambs. I thought it looked better. I thought the Hannibal Lecter was far more subtle and better done, and not you know flicking his tongue in your face, which I thought was you know terrible and terribly done. I was much more scared of Brian Cox than I was yeah. of of, and I just thought. But then again, you know, I love the '80s aesthetic. I love that modernist with the pastel colors and the very clean lines. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, I mean, if you don't like that aesthetic, of course you'll hate it. Um, but I, I like him. I think he's, I like that formalism. Um, um, it reminds me, it's, you know, it, it, to me, it's the film version of modernist architecture. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but that might be what you don't like about it. Um, um, yeah, um, I, I do agree with you. Brian Cox is the best actor. Uh, people should... People he's barely have. in the movie, and he's so terrifying, oh, right? I, I mean, I mean, just, I have, would you give me your home phone <laughs> number, Will? And he's like, oh, my God, no. Right? It's like, <laughs> well, Brian, Brian Cox is a wonderful actor. So he did a great, good. He did a great Menenius for um, uh, Ray Fiennes, uh, Coriolanus, which people should look up. He played a great amazing. villain in the second X-Men movie. Mm -hmm. He was amazing in the American version of The Ring. Um, um, really terrifying. Um, he's just a freaking great actor. Um, he's a, uh, isn't he an OBE? Um, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Uh, um, um, but anyway, so, so, so does it change, yeah. does it affect your thesis at all if the cinematic elements entered in earlier, um, before they became big? I mean, almost, you know, when the nineties, it sort of really became a thing. Right. Um, but so uh, I, I've been, you know, Obviously, there's more for me to discover here, but I do come back to this idea, which is when I was a kid, that hadn't taken over. That may have existed more than I realized. It may have been swelling under the surface, but Seinfeld still ruled the roost. Right. Miami Vice was already over by then. Yeah. And while it had had a huge cultural impact that was partly tied into also with MTV, mm -hmm. It was pretty much over by the time by the, yeah, the time 80s, we're talking about. The eighties really disappeared once they were gone. Like the seventies didn't necessarily disappear. Yeah. 
after, yeah. you know. Yeah. But the, something about 1984, Flock of Seagulls, Miami Vice, it yeah. just, it would have gone. Yeah. It was yeah. gone. gone. Yeah. And um, uh, it's, it's really interesting, but I still, I see the sea change happen. I think, I think you're think, right. It, it became ubiquitous in the 90s in a way. Um, it, it took over in a way that it hadn't, right? Really um, in the um, thousands. I mean, yeah, yeah. Barely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's right. That's right. Um, that's right. Yeah. Uh, it, it became, or put it to you this way, in, the, in 2006, if you wanted to know what was going on on television, You'd have to be looking at those kinds of shows, right? Because that's any right. sort of narrative history, right? Right. Uh, would right. have to focus on um, focus on those series, right? Those cinematic series, right? Um, right. 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 Um, so why don't we talk about you go? Let's go back and you talk about okay. So the cinematic elements enter in, but there's still this sort of balance. It's still got a lot of distinctively TV qualities that are tied to this serial weekly going on for years. You can develop very in-depth portraits of groups of people and their lives and so on and so forth um, so, to where the cinematics were just simply uh, uh, an, imp an improvement of something rather than a complete uh, absorption of it into the cinematic paradigm. How did that go, and then when did it sort of go south for you, as right. far as you're concerned? Well, one thing is, I don't, you know, improvements, I suppose, I mean... That's the sense I got from the essay, but if that's well, wrong, if I'm wrong about that... I mean, I you didn't lament it. You didn't lament mm -mm. it, right? No, I mean, I think the feeling for a lot of people is there's some, something new under the sun has arrived, and it's exciting. Yeah, which uh, you know, it doesn't always. <laughs> I read a quote that supposedly Miles Miles Davis said, "The music keeps on changing. It's got nothing to do with good or bad." You know, and it's you, something about something about art. Uh, it just has to change, right? Yeah, we need novelty. Uh, it didn't matter. But that doesn't mean that we don't. Look, music's a good example. Yeah, um, music had to change in this after the '60s, and you know it did, and, and in a lot of interesting ways. But I think certainly rock music, um, once you get past the mid '70s, it became yeah. very. It, it turned into something that was stagnant and uninteresting, and that was the reason why, in a sense, punk had to break it, right? Um, um, and so, it something can, things can, in a sense, undergo changes that are lamentable, right? Oh, sure. Um, 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 so, I mean, I only meant it in that sense. I got the sense from you that you thought that the entry of the cinematics was a good thing, but then at some point it became a bad thing is what the sense that I got. Yes, yes. So maybe you could uh, yeah. talk about that. Yeah. It's being a good thing in The Sopranos and maybe but, not, a good not a good thing in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever whatever right. you want to say, you know, it's, we, it's not a good thing. In. <laughs> the only thing I want to distance myself from is the sort of claim that the more cinematic, visually involved paradigm is inherently superior to the most. Yeah, gotcha. Paradigm. So you're not saying, oh, it's better than All in the Family. Right. Right. Well, <laughs> I, well I might say Sopranos is better, although I don't know why I compare Sopranos to All in the Family. But, I, I mean... Uh, you might have to, because I think I'm going to reject that. Okay. So, All right, we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, I think we'll, I'm more we'll of a pure... That. I think I like my things in neater boxes, and I think... I think television got worse. I think I think I think television's golden age was the seventies. Um, mm -hmm. um, but but we'll, yeah, go we'll on, go on. But yeah, I, go on. I also I suggested that um, well, I you know I think that if there was any sort of time where sort of things were glorious and new <laughs> and you know plugging chugging along beautifully, it'd be like the Sopranos, Mad Men. Yeah, and more recently, which is this is all fairly recent. Um, there's there's now sort of on television. There's a problem of emulation. Things have begun to ossify. Um, 
become a bit sclerotic. Uh, Meaning that they're they're doing too much of the same thing. A little bit of that, but I think so. It's good that we talked about how I think while the Sopranos and shows like that borrowed a lot from film, they maintained a certain kind of distinctive. That distinctiveness, it seems to me, is eroding. And more people are trying to do things on television, which I don't think find an easy home on television. And Breaking Bad, to me, was the, the sign of that. Okay. Um, so maybe you can talk now. We can talk about this transition. So the, kinds of, the kind of uses of cinematics in Sopranos, which you think mm -hmm. is good, and then when you, th when you think it starts to not be good is with a show that's like Breaking Bad. Maybe you could talk about that so we can get a sense of what, what you think is different, what changed. Yeah, well, I mean, what's remarkable now is we talked about what was on television uh, was, was so different from what was on the big screen in 1973. Right, totally right? different, yeah. <laughs> now you look at what's on <laughs> the big screen and what's on television, and it's stunningly continuous like the big the uh, two biggest shows are game of thrones and walking dead one is based based on a comic book uh, which is right you know what, what's really used in terms of the big screen it's the big comic book movie especially marvel yeah and then also people are trying and failing to make movies out of DC comics. Yeah. But there was Batman. Before. That's a whole other interesting story about yeah. why Marvel succeeded and DC seems not to be, but we'll have to do that on a different dialogue. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but, but comic book movies are just the people are just going through trying to find every single character and adapting it. Green Arrows. And like, who, I'd never heard of Guardians of the Galaxy. Got yeah. Tim Gunn to make some very good movies, you know. Um, uh, there and that's gone on on television, and it's so much the case that Marvel actually has television shows which exist in the same universe <laughs> as what's going on on the big screen. I mean, it's that continuous, and they actually inform each other. Like, I mean, if you want to get the full story mm -hmm. of what happened in Captain America: Winter Soldier, you have to watch Agents of Shield. And vice versa. And I almost wonder whether this is partly a marketing strategy, right? I mean, oh, to get people to just keep to just keep consuming these products, right? Undoubtedly. And yeah, this, yeah. I mean, this is a thing that comic books have been doing for years. And comic books are, are always shamelessly commercial. Let's, yeah, yeah. Let's sell more books to kids with advertisements yeah. for whatever kids want. But your, your, your essay is about medium. So let's stick yeah. with that. I mean, so... so, so but what's, what's wrong with what's what, what is it that's happened with Breaking Bads and with now Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or Daredevils or whatever? What's happened, do you think, in terms of medium? It strikes me they're more and more, they're attempting things that, that can't be done very well on television. And I'm thinking, uh, I, I have this experience, and this is where it's going to get subjective, and I'm just going to have to, the, the this will stand up or fall down on whether or not the audience resonates to this and whether they have a set of experience to buy out. But watching Breaking Bad, I had the feeling where I was trying to mentally blow up the image on, uh, on television, mm. where I was, I was thinking like, you know, something, it starts with this sequence. The first scene in the first episode with the Winnebago barreling through the desert, there, you know, uh, uh, Walter's pants are wafting through the breeze, and then he's standing pantless, pointing a gun down the road. And, uh, you know, I sort of wanted to see this on the, um, you know, it's, it struck me that it's like, okay, I could imagine that, that image of Walter pointing a gun down the road. Uh, at me, you know, 30 feet above me. And it's, you know, it's uh, overwhelming. Um, I sort of, there, there are certain scenes, that scene, the famous here, goddamn right scene, where it reminded me for some reason of like the big stare down at the end of The Good, Bad, and the Ugly. 
Where yeah. you just have I think you mentioned that in the essay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. We then Cleef and um, and Clint Eastwood, and they just hold the screen. There's uh, somebody once said about uh, the very similar movie, uh, How the West, or not How the West Dreams, but Once Upon a Time in the West, um, that uh, it was in in opera in which the songs are stared, not sung, where. Uh, oh, t- oh, what's his name, man, the director? Of who? Which of which one? Both of them. The same guy. The Italian. Leone. Like uh, yeah, Sergio Leone. Yeah. I think. Um, uh, he he just has this great quality where he can get just actors to stare intensely as many scenes that work that way. But it, you, you can't. If you've seen, I've seen both. The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and How the West Was One on theater and on DVD. It just works in the theater. I mean, watch it on DVD, sure, but yeah, in the theater, it has a different effect. So is the point really sort of that you can introduce the cinematics into television to a degree, but there simply is a limit given the size of the screen, even if you yeah. have a huge widescreen TV. And what, what they're doing now with these things, and I noticed in like all the Marvel movies, it's, I mean, people have fucking enormous TVs now. I mean, right. I mean, I mean, is this is this really is that just it, or is there something else about it that doesn't work? Is it just the size of the screen? I think the size of the screen is the most operative thing. I mean, it really, even if you're working out looking at a really big TV, it's different than being in, 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 a, a, theater. in a theater. Um, Although I've been in some very small theaters and seen some very big TVs where well, you feel like you're watching a widescreen too. <laughs> but um, I saw the fits in a very small room. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. But you know that's rare. Let me, let me just ask you. You know, this just occurred to me. But why do you th- why do you think? It, I mean, and maybe this is just pushing a little bit on how how much medium really constrains. Why do you think it is that so many? very talky films that don't take all this advantage of the distinctive medium work so well. Um, um, uh, You know, Room with a View or, you know, uh, My Dinner with Andre or, you know, um, or, 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 you know, in other words, or I mean, I thought you would would go to Howard Hawks. Yeah, but you know what I mean? I mean, in other words, there are movies, there, there are very much, there are movies that are very much, that are very theatrical Mm -hmm. um, um, in terms of, you know, you know, they all were. Rope, That's why rope, right? Yeah, yeah. All yeah. this I guess. Well, I guess what I'm asking is how, how much, how hard do you want to push this on medium and constraint? Pretty. Hard. I can think of films where it works really well, and it might as well be a play, right? I wouldn't say that. I mean, I love those films. But, uh, they were old. That's why all those movie stars sounded British. They were, they were imitating British theater. They were. Uh, uh, yeah, they were doing like a kind of West End theater in, uh, in the movies, and but if you've ever analyzed those films, um, Howard Hawks, uh, uh, um, what's uh, one of the German refugees? Uh, Heaven can wait. Uh, Ernst Lubitsch. You know the editing, the camera work. There is a lot that's subtly distinctive mm. to film that has uh, right. a deep impact. We, sh- we shouldn't always... think of cinematic just as spectacle, as big spectacle. As right. Oh yes, that, it's I mean, all, def- it's, I understand what you're getting at. Okay. No, that's not that's, that's not a real objection. And I, I wasn't. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Of course, it's not just because all the movies we're talking about are relatively spectacly movies. And um, but it, that's not the only element of cinematics that you're talking about. You mentioned Rome. I'm always fascinated by the distinction. Uh, or rear window, right? I mean, yeah. or, you know, yeah, 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 the yeah, whole yeah. thing is in one freaking room, right? I mean, Twelve Angry Men. Yeah. Um, <laughs> works amazingly I'm, well, right? I'm always fascinated by those movies that are toying with the tension between the media. Um, uh, that are, are, but it's a kind, those movies, which I love, there's a kind of virtuosity to it. 
Um, you have to be really, really good to, for those to work. Is what you're yeah. saying. No nope. slot. No, no half-ass directors can make stuff like that, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Rope was uh, was uh, was Hitchcock, and it's it's official. It's basically one shot. That was the gimmick, right? Which it's their trickery. There's trickery to it. But the point was, let's do something and have it all be one shot in one location. And it was a kind of Rivera, Hitchcock was deliberately pushing himself and, and to do something with cinema business with actually 12 Angry Men. And all people, people not familiar with the movie, all ex it's a, about a jury. Yeah. And basically all except for about three minutes takes place in this jury room. And the, the scenes outside the jury room are sort of deliberately perfunctory. These two guys who have been arguing for two hours meet each other yeah. on the street and they tell each other the names and they're like, Oh, well, I guess we go home now. Um, but the scenes in that jury room, if you, I think the statements, you have to be very careful making statements about media, but um, theater tends to stay still and cinema tends to move. And if you watch the camera in 12 Angry Men, it's pacing that room like a caged right. animal. It's, it it's, finds, it's nothing like All in the Family or like the Honeymooners where you know, you're basically just... It's rubbing its... People are moving around. and the, Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's rubbing right. its fur against the bars and it's trying to get out. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. It's contained. Yeah, yeah. And you feel that the incredible contained energy. It's why it works so well. Yeah. And uh, Rope is a little different. It's a little less uh, obviously... You don't go like, hey, that's a composed shot as often as you do. That happens all the time. The shot where Martin Balsam puts up his hand to change his vote. You see you know, the one guy's throwing things at the fan. Yeah. You, know, you, you see things and you feel like, oh, that's like a, I want a still of that. You don't yeah. see that in Rope. But if you watch Rope carefully, the editing, there's some very uh, careful decisions. And the way that that camera is pacing and pushing in and out and sort of uh, you mentioned rear window too rear window this is an explicit player kind of quality to it that I think it's also rough. yeah yeah um, uh, so yeah it's deeply informed by the okay so go back we're talking about breaking bad and sort of what what, what went wrong you think mm -hmm. with the with the cinematics um, um, so let's talk about and, that and to, to your point, it's what went wrong is also not just about the spectacle. There are a lot of shots, um, especially I noticed a little hot in Bergo, which I really I like there. But there are shots of they they have very attractive young people, which is uh, important to these comic books. I mean, if Thor doesn't look magnificent, you've got nothing. <laughs> I, if if he doesn't look like you. You could push on him really, really hard, and you still wouldn't fall down. You, yeah. <laughs> you've got nowhere to go. That's the main thing with that guy. So, and they do get you know attractive, sturdy-looking people to do these parts. And there yeah. are some close-ups, especially in romantic scenes, where I, I said that they should uh, they should tower over you like Bogart with a call. You know, uh, it just I I have that same feeling of. This is this should be cinematic. This mm. should be this should be up there on the big screen, and it's not. Uh, and you don't have that in the Sopranos. Everything feels right to scale. Um, and did they? Do you think that they also? So going back to like something like Breaking Bad, because the last thing we're going to talk about is the is the new the new mod the new new model, which is the binge watching model. But do you think that they also? fail to exploit the distinctive values that come from having the weekly format and the and the um and the uh the, the 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 over the course of years the ability to delve into the details or do you think that they still manage to was there a failure there also is it really just they're trying to do things that you really need to be in a movie theater for it to work So there's a difference here between streaming shows and weekly shows. So weekly shows, I think with Breaking Bad, it really did a good job of having self-contained episodes that were sort of one episode was about one theme. Um, so I don't see that problem there. With the streaming shows, there is a difference, I think. 
plus distinctiveness. Do you, that first thing, though, do you think, though, that that's a, a sort of a necessary quality of... Because I'm thinking of there's a lot of shows where there are extended arcs. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of two science fiction shows in particular, one of them being Farscape, which has arcs that go multiple seasons. Um, um, and then Babylon 5, which the entire five years is an arc. Um, yeah. um, so it's not... Uh, do you think that the self-containedness is a necessary quality of a, of a, we of a weekly episodic show? Or I do, and I've seen both those shows. I like to love both those shows. Um, you think there are exceptions to a rule? that Hard cases make bad law, that sort of thing? Um, yeah, well, no. I, I'm struck in both of those shows that even the episodes which deal with plot arcs, the, the one episode has often, I'm mean, not necessarily the sort of thematic center, but there's an, there's an episode of Babylon 5 I'm thinking of where, uh, uh, you remember the one where they're looking, somebody has, is a secret, someone's a Manchurian candidate, someone's a secret mole, and it ends up being the end of the road for a long running character. And yeah things happen that reverberate all through the show. But that episode is about certain unfulfilled longings on the part of multiple characters. Yeah. And, and that gives it a, uh, an emotional tone through the whole thing and it gives it a, an intellectual coherence for that one episode. Even though it's very arky. Yeah. It's very, um, it, it, it has, it, it is in episodes. I guess the other example I was thinking of that one might be a counterexample, but it may not be a genre you're familiar with, is the classical old school soap operas. Mm -hmm. um, and I always found that I could never watch them because if you hadn't watched the whole thing, you had no idea who anybody was or what was going on. Yeah. Um, um, because they were they the whole show was arc, right? I mean, I mean, it was just sort of this ongoing. The other, with, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I I think you have the sense that that's to the detriment, right? But that to that's that that's a uh, that's I'm, to to the detriment of soap operas. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah. And the Although they're hugely successful, so I guess in some sense they weren't a they weren't a detriment, but artistically they're a detriment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The only other show I've seen like that is the old Doctor Who, where it would be a cliffhanger each episode. Yeah, and I watch those on DVD, and I think yeah. they probably work better that way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm actually one of those those uh, heretics that thinks the old Doctor Who is infinitely superior to the new one. So I think the new one's actually quite terrible. Um, but um, but but that'll have to be have to have another conversation <laughs> about that. Um, okay, so I'm getting where you're getting in terms of how it goes bad. So let's let's because uh, we're going pretty long. Let's let's talk now about the last thing you get to in the in the essay, which is this thing about the new new model, which is you put up a whole season, quote unquote season. I don't even know why they call them seasons anymore. Mm -hmm. You put up, you know, 20 episodes or whatever, and the whole idea is that people are just going to binge watch them. Mm -hmm. Now, I was actually surprised that you think that this is a, a positive development and that this is taking TV in a new direction. Um, so why don't you talk about that? Um, a, what direction is it taking it in, and why do you think it's a positive development? And maybe I'll push you a little, and then we probably will wrap it up. Yeah, well, it doesn't have to be an inherent feature of uh, a streaming show that it's sort of meant to be binge-watched. Um, Kimmy Schmidt, which was interestingly supposed to run on NBC. Um, so they filmed, they shot thinking it was going to be weekly. Um, ended up on the streaming service. And those, I think, you should piece them out just because that's the particular aesthetic of that show kind of demands it, or at least rewards it, right? But there are some shows, Stranger Things really stands out to me, where it seems to me you're supposed to watch at least or i've watched it i think twice and i watched it it's eight hours i watched it in either two or three sittings of multiple hours and man it just works that way it just works um it goes there isn't there isn't that sense like we we're talking about that five where an episode feels self quite self-contained sometimes they do a bit and actually, there's kind of a, a real like ending to an episode right at the halfway point. 
And I always wonder if they made it so that you can watch four hours. And yeah, stop yeah, yeah. And watch four hours. Yeah. I'm starting to think the issue is with the self-containedness is really more of sort of a kind of internal narrative coherence within mm-hmm. within an hour. Mm-hmm. Um, that that that. So it's not so much that you have to have known something from a previous episode, but more that the episode is narratively coherent internally w- within the time frame that it, that it, that it, that it's shot in before the cre- the starting credits and the ending credits. You're saying that that's no lo- not the case with a show like Stranger Things. Yeah. And um and yeah, so then why works. chop it why chop it up into pieces? Why not make why not make a 10-hour episode? Why 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 have starting well, credits and ending I mean, credits? Well, actually part of I mean Stranger Things they got No, it does. Um, It's a great critic. Um, So it's fun to return to. Um, But no, there. But if there's no narrative coherence expected within the discrete unit of an hour, why even chop it up into hours? No, I wouldn't say there's no narrative coherence. I'd say it's a uh, it's a looser thing, and it it bleeds nicely into the next one. Uh, where it doesn't feel like the last episode didn't have any satisfying ending. So the episode we were talking about, Babylon 5, the end of that particular episode, it's a very emotional, resonant thing. And there's a kind of denouement and a uh, little surprise at the end. And, I, you know, watching that, I want to be like, I want to sit with this. <laughs> and then, you know, you know, Think about it for half an hour. Yeah. Or better, whatever you're going to do. Yeah. Um, but in, in, you know, something like Stranger Things, there is an ending to an episode. And something, we get to, something evolves with the characters. Or, you know, something, what they were doing, or a lot of the times it's sort of like somebody is looking for information. End of the end of the episode, they found it, right? They're on, or we're moving forward, right? Right. Um, there's um, uh, there there is a kind of closing. It, it, it makes sense, emotional and intellectual sense that it ends where it does, and yet there's enough sort of. The events are naturally going to lead to the events that will start the next episode, and the sort of emotional tone is there. So it's kind of up to you where, how long you want to go on. And I was talking, I've had very interesting comments, and I said to somebody who was commenting, they put me in mind of the fact that um, a classicist uh, that I studied with when I was in Chicago. I was reading in translation, though. I think we I was reading the Odyssey in translation, uh, the classicist, proper classicist, and he, he made the brilliant comment. What it, uh, part of what it means for a poem to be an epic poem is that no matter how much you f- poetry you feel like reading, no matter how psyched up you are to read poetry today, there's more poem than you want. And of course, that's the way it was performed. If you know about the Homeric tradition, yeah. they didn't, you know, people sang um, parts. That, you know, they for they would either pick something for the occasion, or somebody would request right. something, and they would tell, you know, the fall of Troy, or you know, they'll hear the one about the Lotus Eaters, right? And that, there's that kind of sense where uh, there's a kind of continuousness, right? You just you just have to stop somewhere. And, you know, Homer is unassailably high art. So, I mean, the fact that the where you end is up to you doesn't strike me as an inherent problem. Um, yeah, other, other media are like that. And, yeah. it, and there's something about immersiveness that you just want to sink into it for hours. And there's something about the visual aspect that I noticed all these shows play into. All these shows are full of texture. Um, yeah. Jessica Jones has a foggy, neon lit New York City. Daredevil has 
his rainy, rainy sort of um, Fritz Long Hell's Kitchen, uh, Stranger Things. We spend a lot of time both in the Upside Down and in this uh, this big forest full, you know, rattling dead leaves and uh, a great sense of physical texture. And somehow yeah. that, that that interacts with the length of the thing. That it's just something you want to just crawl up inside. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it strikes me, and I don't know whether, you know, all the things you're describing, these, these, these virtues, uh, are all non-social. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess I think that, and here's something, this is something I, I really, I do lament, and, um, and I think it's, it's happening for so many reasons that it's a sort of a hopeless lamentation. But I mean, um, First of all, I do think that traditional television and the mold you we originally started we started with is is going to be completely gone. Mm -hmm. um, that's the first thing, and I just don't think that, yeah. that that weekly show thing is going to exist anymore. Louis C.K. keeps trying to bring it back. I know, failing. I know, um, um, and you know, it's not just that I think that something that has its own in inherent value, it's a sad thing when it goes, um, and that there's and that one one wishes to have more things that are valuable rather than fewer things that are valuable. But one of the things that's sort of distinctively valuable about it, um, I think is, is very bad to lose. And that's the social dimension. And that's, but that's a function of so many things. It's not just a function of the binge watching phenomenon. And I'll, I'll explain why I think it's antisocial, um, but also a result of, cable and the lack of the th loss of the three major networks it's a function of um so it's a function of a whole bunch of th you know, the internet certainly um it's it, you know and even you might even say you know when 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 dvds of tv shows started coming out because you know the whole binge watching thing started when you could buy whole seasons of shows on dvd which you know mm -hmm. has been true now for years way before netflix started releasing whole series you know what's the difference between releasing a whole series on Netflix so that people have been watching and me going and buying all five seasons of Babylon 5 on DVD. Um, but here, here's what I think is somewhat, somewhat lost, and that is, you know, when with, with the old way of television, you know, you watch an episode and then there'd be a week between that and the next one. It wasn't just that you could sit and th sit with it and think about it a little bit, but that you could go and talk with others about it. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times, th these weren't national conversations i mean i remember you know when when edith the, there was an episode with edith going through menopause mm -hmm. and this was the occasion for you know a public conversation and I remember remember the contest episode yeah or yeah yeah or the abortion episode with yeah 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 and so you know there's this sort of you know i remember you know when the day after aired um i remember going to school the next day you know the day after it was a show i think it was 1983 i think it was 84 about a nuclear a nuclear war mm -hmm. and i remember going to i can remember this going to school the next day and you could have heard a pin drop <laughs> people were so devastated and and and, and, and it, it led to conversations uh -huh. and now i just have this horrible image of people just in their houses by themselves it almost has a virtual reality kind of quality of people immersing themselves into these experiences. It's like and really, Fahrenheit 451. And really not sharing it with anybody. And, and it not occasioning a public conversation. And it's not, and that's the extent to which I think it's, it's a terrible loss. Um, I think it, it's contributing to the disintegration of any kind of sort of public culture. Um, and, and I think that this actually is, is much more damaging than people give it credit for. I mean, I think people underestimate how important these things are. Um, when that last episode of MASH ran, uh, I just remember, I remember talking about people about it for days. Um, um, and, and that, that, that creates a kind of connectedness between us. We share things that are in the popular culture that now we don't share, at least we don't share them in the same way. Um, so that's why I really don't like this development because I, I don't mind if it exists, but I don't like the fact that it seems like it's going to drive out the older model. So I don't know how you feel about this, but that's my main. As far as uh, the social 
uh, aspect of it. Um, I largely am inclined to agree. Um, <clears throat> it's a real blessing and a curse. On the one hand, you know, it, it's not like one one size fits all. You know, there's Mash and there's All in the Family, and those shows were all supposed to have broad appeal, and they could, you know. They were supposed to appeal to everybody, but maybe not something that's specifically to you. Um, there's something I loved. Uh, I loved Adult Swim, uh, especially as a kid on on uh, late at night on uh, Cartoon Network, and it was something that was really edgy. It was only ever going to appeal to a narrow strip of the population, but it was yeah. extremely compelling in a different way because. Um, if you got it, you felt like you were in on something. It was, you know, it, it was, I, I feel about it like I think people felt about Flying Circus in the 70s. It was challenging. It was offbeat. Um, they did something brilliant. They made fun of the audience. Uh, yeah. They had bumps yeah. in between the shows where they talk about, like, you idiots keep sending in these emails. Um, and, you know, that was its own kind of, you know, great pleasure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah great, great satisfaction. Yeah. Um, which couldn't have really have existed if everybody had six channels. Um, like, think, but, you know, but it's, it's, you mentioned, you said about All in the Family and, and MASH in particular, you sort of, you know, well, you know, these were intended to have a broad appeal. But what strikes me about them is precisely that they often addressed topics and themes that were very controversial. Mm -hmm. And yet, still had that broad appeal today mm -hmm. something that politically charged the only people watching would be people who agreed with the sentiment right and, other, and, and and they would be able to only watch it because of the way that it's delivered and 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 because in other words i don't see i, I i'm going to go on a limb here and i'm sure people will disagree with this in the comments but i actually think that i would want to make the argument that part of the reason why we are so divided partisan wise is precisely because we have very few avenues left for so for public conversation about matters of, of controversy and that that's often somewhat dif made made easier when it's through popular entertainment um and and that 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 the loss of that kind of tv watch program and that kind of tv watching is actually very very detrimental to our social health um 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 and that's why it seems like the positions have almost hardened to the point where people can't even talk to each other at all about matters of controversy, whereas back then you could. I mean, I guarantee you that there were, you know, feminists and non-feminists watching these shows, that there were people mm -hmm. who were pro-abortion and anti-abortion watching these shows. And maybe it provided an opportunity, and because there was a week between episodes, some space to talk about things that now we just... It we made to stand on opposite sides of a street and throw rocks at each other over. You I know? mean, we're, we are reflected in the title. We were all in the family. One country. That's right. And it's even in the ensemble, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you have the liberal and then you have the conservative in the house, right? And, and, while, together, they, and while they're and fighting... And they love each they, other. Yeah, even though they fight bitterly. Yes. And there are more... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, yeah, I think you're right. I want to sort of flag something here. We, mm -hmm. we, we're not going to be able to explore it, but um, <clears throat> you know this conversation that keeps rearing up? I guess, uh, well, it's been discussed uh, in, in these pages, as it were, um, about where America's missing intellectuals, you know, why is there no more Lionel trilling? Yeah. Uh, you know, it doesn't our political conversation lack something? Uh, and I think it does, and I think people who are saying that, no, there, you know, we have Robert Putnam and we have, uh, we have all this great research, are, they're wrong and there are missing intellectuals. And there are a few people who think about politics and think about the humanities in, in a visible way. Right? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so we were talking about television purely from artistic point of view, and we ended up with a conversation about something that I think is quite salient to our politics. And we'll miss that if we don't have people who think about politics uh, 
through a humanities lens, and yeah. through, through an aesthetic lens. Yeah. So there's a certain aesthetics to politics. Um, so I wanted to say that. And yes, I think you're largely right. There's a kind of West Wing effect, and um, Aaron yeah. Sorkin, God, um, yeah. uh, and the Daily Show effect, where people just... Uh, the Daily Show, it's interesting, it was never really funny. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get a lot of flack for saying it. John Stewart, I think John Stewart's a funny guy, but he was rarely interested in being funny on that show. He yeah. was interested, it's the forced laughter, the ha ha, it's I get it, I want you to see me getting it. The laughter of, uh, and, and of the release of tension. And I understand how it happens. I mean, these days, the politics are so obnoxious. They were obnoxious then, but the Iraq war, where you just wanted to feel like, God, I want someone to agree with me. And, but I do absolutely the point agree. That was, the point wasn't that it wasn't contentious then. I mean, you could argue it was much more contentious in the 60s, let's say. But that mm -hmm. it was possible to have a sort of public conversation, which seems now like it's not possible right. to have. Um, and and I, do think, I do think that the change in television has something to do with that in the sense that we share a lot less nationally, right? And if you, um, went, to, yeah, if you went to relax with all the family, it also didn't let you go. It just yeah. Give you your opinion back. It, if, if you were sympathetic with Meathead, it would uh, confront you with Archie. If you were yeah. sympathetic to Archie, it would confront that, you with Meathead. That's right. So you, you've got... Uh, yeah, you know, equal time, right? You couldn't, so, completely, you couldn't completely villainize the other person because no. they, they, they were being presented to you together, you know, and, and they didn't completely villainize each other, right? right. Um, and so, and so, um, um, and, and yeah. it, people are going to say there was that conservative woman on West Wing, knock it off. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I do think, I do think that the weekly format does have a lot to do with that, this ability to digest something and to talk to neighbors and friends um about it um um really the the you which you can't do if you watch a whole season of something by yourself at once mm -hmm. right um um yeah it just doesn't lend itself to that it doesn't lend itself to that kind of thoughtfulness and to then going around and, and talking about hey did you see that last did you see that last night and holy shit blah blah, blah. And, you know, go to your school after the first episode of, you know, after after day after things and just sort of talk to each other and, and I just don't see that happening now. It's not that people don't talk about television. They don't talk about it in the same way. Um, yeah. And they're not watching the, you know, the people. It's much more going to be likely that you're going to, if you're talking to somebody about a show, it's, 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 it's a community of the like-minded, right? right. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, Philip Kitcher laments that we no longer have a, a Walter Cronkite to say, yeah. and that's how it is. And liberals believe them and conservatives believe them. It's, it's, yeah. He said, I realized when he said that's how it is, we all believed it. Yeah. And this is sort of the entertainment version of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's no one thing where we all Yeah. Or or many, many, many of us yeah. Yeah. come around and reflect that. And I do you know, I, I really like the OA, which is interesting because <laughs> it's um it's all about social yeah disintegration. But it's also contributing to it. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know. I just wish that the one was. I mean, it's not so much that I look. I mean, I watch Man on High Castle. I think it's great. I mean, I don't think it's the book. Um, um, and and I and I think it's you know very doing something entirely different from the book. And in that sense, I don't like it since I, I think the book's a masterpiece. But it's not that I mind the bin, the new new model in itself it's that i mind the fact that it seems like it's going to drive out the old the old version the old model um and i don't i'd rather have both <laughs> um mm -hmm. but i think the old model already was dying with the loss of the networks and you know with the with it no longer being focused on the major networks i guess this was sort of inevitable that it was going to go this way eventually um and um but uh yeah i just i think we've lost i think we will have lost something and that we can see the effects of it, um, but Tel Aviv, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, uh, well, yeah. I guess TV keeps on uh, changing. It's got nothing to do with good or bad. That's right. <laughs>
There you go. That's, you know, that's a good one to end on. Um, David, thank you so much. Uh, we will link to the essay. I encourage people to uh, read it and see what they think. You'll have a whole discussion there that we didn't touch on about 3D and cinema, which um, you think, uh, if done right, has some really great promise to exploit things that are distinctive and unique to the medium. And um, a really interesting opening discussion of the film Doctor Strange, which I, I really enjoyed. And so... Um, I will uh, we'll see you around these parts soon again. All right, David? I hope so. All right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Take care.